So um, the first, I guess I was going to thank the sponsors, but I guess Tyler already did. Um, I believe this is the largest number of sponsors we had in JUC. Um, and then, you know, these, I'm sorry for hotel guys, but these hotels cost arms and legs. I really appreciate um, the sponsors for making this event possible. So, so I, was, um, I was looking at the Jenkins adoption statistics, and I thought it'd be fun to present it in a way in terms of what happens in average week in the Jenkins project. All right? So as you probably already know, every week about one release comes out, um, normally Sunday or Monday. And that release gets downloaded about 48,000 times within that week. And this is enough data to fill uh, 513 DVDs. So that's a lot of data that we are sieving out from our servers. And at the same time, if you look at the plugins, we have about 3.5 releases of brand new plugin. These are the plugin that has never been released before hit our update center. So every once the other day, uh, someone writes a new plugin and make it available to the, uh, to the community. And in the same time period, existing plugins get releases 25 times. So, um, and then combined with all the 600 plugins that we have, in a week we get about half a million downloads of all these plugins. So again, that's a lot of bytes that we are sending out, and uh, thanks for our mirrors for making this possible. The users filed about 80 tickets in our ticket system in a week, and the developers fix about 50 of those in a week. <laughs> So there's a growing list of uh, the issues that needs to be worked on. And uh, to produce these 50 uh, fixes, uh, they produce about 145 commits in a week. And, so, um, and um, the users around that week, about 400 new Jenkins installations pop up. Um, so I'd imagine there are some that's getting retired. So I suppose in reality, there's a bit more numbers than that. Um, and then the people are adding about the 1,200 slaves in a week to the Jenkins installations. So I did a math, and I think if I'm doing the calculation correctly, if people are doing this in the office hours, I mean, I'm sorry, the business hours, it's about every one slave three minutes adding, added, to the, uh, added to the world um, Jenkins cluster. So I'm starting to seriously worry about my, the, uh, the footprint on the Earth, uh, the global warming effect of all these electricity we are using. And all these uh, 1,200 slaves added to the new system, um, we also added 19,000 new jobs in each week. So, you know, if J Jenkins is running as a United States presidential race, I think that this guy could have a pretty good chance of winning because he's a serious job creator, right? <laughs> so, um, I touched on this earlier, but because now you're seeing the new plugin every other day, um, we just passed the 600 marks. So, the last week I checked that the number we had the 600 or six plugins. And the tickets has been growing also lately, and I guess I already touched on that growing gap. Even though the development pace is also going up, I guess we just can't keep up with the, uh, the user activities, which, to be fair, I think it's normal in any project, but uh, that's what it is. And uh, we also track the number of installations around the world that satisfy certain criteria. So, um, and according to that number, we are about the 47,000 installations. So this is a conservative estimate because I know that, for example, certain companies that deploy Jenkins in large scale didn't want to participate in this program and they are not sending any data to us. So um, there are usage, uh, the number of users, the, the existing installations are growing quite, quite nicely, um, to my surprise. So it's, I think it's safe to say that at this point, Jenkins is used by pretty much everyone, that everyone that matters. And um, so that's about, the, um, that's about the adoptions. So um, I wanted to show some of the features that we've been doing recently. And um, let's see. I hope, well, maybe many of you have kind of the, I apologize that the screen is a bit hard to see, but um, if you haven't been updated for a while, uh, you might see some of the features um, uh, that's new here. So, for example, let me start with the update center. So, for example, um, if you go to the update center, because we have so many plugins now available, we have to come up with this scheme that allows you to type in a few words, um, which gives you the future down list of the plugins. So you can very easily find the one that you want to install. Um, 
And we also get to install plugins without restart now. This has been internally a bit of a tricky change, but we finally managed to make it work. Um, so once the plugin is installed, you can simply come back to the top page, and um, they will be available for you to use. So uh, let's see, if I go to the configuration page, I should be able to see this newly installed um, XPFP plugin support. There you go. Um, and also in the configuration page, this is where we made a number of improvements. So for example, if you look at the click this help icon, now we show which plugin this uh, feature came from. So you know, if you're using Jenkins for a long time, you end up with lots of plugins that you don't know if anyone is using. This will help you find the ones that you might care about. Um, in a similar, in the plugin sec, I mean, the, sorry, in the configuration page, we made this post build actions, uh, the drop down menu plus uh, the, the basically in the same style as the main build section. So this helps you um, reduce the page, I mean, the, the scroll size, and also these things can be reordered by dragging and drop. And um, again, I'm sorry, the color is really washed out here, so it's, you have to trust me when I say this, but um, when you hover your mouse over to the head section, the, um, so this is a drag, this, you can drag drop these sections to reorder things, but for the longest time I've been getting the feedback that this is not quite discoverable. So I was sitting with the, uh, the guy, I think in JFrog, who was a designer, and I taught, showed that this is a problem we are having, and what can we do about it, and he has this idea of showing, I guess, the, the lines, the dotted lines around the box to make it more obvious. Um, so that comes up as a, as a gray line, although I, can, I can't really see it from here, but uh, you'll see it in your own instance, so let's, let's put it that way. Um, and then we also had this, the, uh, the breadcrumb bar sitting at, sticking at the top of the page, and especially in the configuration page, um, you'll see that it provides uh, in-page navigations. So I guess if you have the long job configuration that, and you wanted to make a quick change, you could just uh, click to jump to the right section and make a small edit, and at the bottom of the page, the save button and the apply button, or oh, this apply button is another new thing, but you can click it to make changes without uh, busily scrolling your mouse. Now, this apply button allows you to save things, uh, save the configuration without leaving the page. So, you know, in the typical cycle of you editing the page and then the, doing the build to see if it's correct, um, you can use the two tabs and then do this very efficiently without ever having a page transitions. Now, the, this, um, I guess I've already somewhat used it, but the other thing we added was the context menu. So let's say, you know, we look at this, a job that's fading, so naturally we wanted to see what the console output is. Now this, we can just do this in a single click of a mouse, and again, if you realize that this was caused by the configuration problem, um, we can use the, uh, the breadcrumb bar to jump to the configuration page. And um, the, this has been, the, the latest addition to this thing is a submenu. So finally, from anywhere in this page, you can go to this config system link in one click without going through the Manage Jenkins page transition. So I think that's a, I really like the change. Um, so I think that's what I wanted to show in terms of the user improve, I mean the user UI improvements. But there are a lot more changes that's happening in Jenkins beyond what you can see. For example, there are a number of front end changes that's not quite visible to users. Um, we've been modular, I mean, we've been modernizing the JavaScript dependencies. For example, we bumped up to Yahoo UI 3 and then Prototype 1.7. The challenge is with these JavaScript guys that they don't care whatsoever about backward compatibility. So like one, one would expect that the Prototype 1.6 to 1.7 is like, you know, it's a minor version enough, right? So you expect the API compatibility, but the API compatibility, my ass. Um, <laughs> so, the, we had to, uh, so we had to actually add back some of the methods that they removed, which is really painful. But so we did all this hard work. Um, we also spend a lot of time improving the page load performances. So uh, we, I was working with a guy in New Zealand and using his VPN proxy to send that packet back to that there and then come back to the US to, to really ex exaggerate the effect of the page loading effect. And so now we use the uh, GZIP compression very liberally and we make sure, we revisited the way the static assets from the plugins are cached. So make sure that the, um, the, the, these assets, once it's loaded into your browser, could be used without browser ever hitting 
the server again for revalidations. Uh, we, not, we started noticing that the many plugins are now relying on the common JavaScript library like jQuery to do things. So we packaged the jQuery as a Jenkins plugin so that the multiple plugins would be able to reuse the same dependencies. Um, and uh, we also, it used to be that we had this 3,000 line of single JavaScript file that grown out of control organically. So we've been making, uh, modularizing it a little bit to trim it down. I think we cut the size about in half and we still have some more ways to go. So there's a number of all these progresses that's made in the front end that you don't see. And again, there is not, you know, front end is just one part of the Jenkins, right? There's a lot of more pieces. And in fact, much of the functionality of Jenkins is actually in the back end. So to give you some example of what's been happening in the back end, um, if you look at one functionality area called the multi-configuration project, um, just in this subsection, we had this improvement such as enabling you to do concurrent builds. So I guess in case you don't know what the uh, multi-configuration project is, this is a way of letting you configure one thing and then run the same thing on multiple different configurations. So you see like six blue balls. So what that means is that you're running the same configuration over six different environments. Now, so in this way, that means, so we are now letting you run this set of six as a unit and then you can run lots of them in concurrently. So if you have enough computers, you get a lot of parallelism out of it. We re-implemented the way workspace sharing works between these guys. So if let's say the test for Postgres and test for MySQL can share the same workspace, then you can tell Jenkins accordingly and then it will save to this space. And we also provided the mechanism to do a uh, partial rebuild. So let's say out of those six combinations, one of them failed because the Postgres server was grumpy. Instead of re-executing the whole six test, you could just execute the one that had failed and then you know, see for the, for the other five builds, you can see, kind of see through the previous build record and then make, it, make everything blue to make a manager happy. Um, and then this part has gotten a number of extension points. Um, we created the, um, we allow the axis, which is like, you know, the thing you see on this side and that side, can change the values dynamically. So for example, you can now create an axis that lists all the subversion tags, and then let's say execute a certain task against all task tags or branches. Um, we also made this version control checkout behavior pluggable. And then so is the order of executions, what do you filter things, and so on. So sometimes this combination, some combination might not make sense. So you can filter them out in a programmatic way. So that opens up a lot of interesting potential for plugins. And then in the other area of backends, for example, there's a great improvements in the REST API. We have supported API tokens so that your programs could talk to Jenkins as you, but without revealing your password. And you know, for those of us who use the same password on multiple sites, you don't really want to review the real password, right? So that's convenient here. A whole bunch more is exposed to the REST API, so you can now install plugins, find out what plugins has been installed, their dependencies, you know, what's executing, what are the slaves you have. You can create new slaves, delete ones, or update configuration entirely through HTTP calls. Um, on the data retrieval side, we also made the um, May fix the um, incompatibility between the tree parameter, which is a means of selecting the data that you want to get, with the XML, because I'm an XML guy, and then so you can combine the power of XPath with this filtering to very quickly get the data you want, often with the, some server-side processing of it. Um, so as a good example of what you can do with the REST API, the Clifano implemented a Node.js uh, Jenkins client called Nestor. So um, he has driven some of the improvements in the reference of API. The other pillar of the remote access to Jenkins is the command line interface, and then this is another area we made a lot of improvements. So for one thing, the transport is now encrypted, so you, you, know, you can safely use it over the public network. Um, the authentication is now done, done through SSH public key. So if you're already using that and have that infrastructure set up, you don't have to deal with yet another password. And, and if we, it, even more, um, we actually allowed you to use standard, loan, standard SSH client as the client for the uh, Jenkins CLI. So if you wanted, for example, to start a build, um, you can type in the SSH and specify some port to talk to Jenkins. And then this will build the job name who, and dash S option, the synchronous, makes this client wait for the build to complete. And dash V for verbose, it actually dump the console output that Jenkins is doing onto this SSH client. 
So this is really a convenient way to create a bigger automation that you know, spans through Jenkins and a number of other things. Um, and then, so again, there are lots of improvements like that, but there are a, a few, few, few new features that's sort of just coming now, or in the, I think in the, this, this is going to hit the release next week or so, I believe, but they are, it's so exciting that I couldn't help but talk about it. That is, um, you know, as you know, the, if your Jenkins installation gets large, um, it, it's not uncommon to see instances taking like minutes to, take, to sort of start doing the builds because it had a, well, you know, I guess I, I made a stupid implementation the choice to load up everything in advance up front, because I guess I didn't imagine that it gets this popular, right? Uh, so finally, I mean, for the longest time, we also know what had to be done, which is to lazy load the build record. So it's wait before the loading of the record until that somebody, that, until that's actually requested. So finally, this has been implemented, um, and then it's ready to be released, I think, within a few weeks. So um, we are getting the great result, and it's already been deployed to some of the production servers, like Apache. Um, and um, so I'm very happy with this change. Another one that's perhaps less sexy is in the way the Jenkins persists data. So as, again, hopefully you already know, the Jenkins stores everything in the XML files. And in the, in the upcoming versions, we are, putting, we are going to put this plugin attribute in these elements to describe where this piece came from. And this makes the XML file more self-descriptive, which in turn allows us to for example, move, potentially in the future, move XML files from one place to another, like copy the job from one instance to another without losing the context and stuff like that. So that's actually a pretty strategic change in my mind. So there's a lots of, and then, you know, it's because the Jenkins has a long, and then there's a long list, laundry list of improvements, but I have to stop somewhere because um, I, can, I can spend too much time talking about this. So I guess I'll leave it at that. But, you know, suffice to say that we've been busy um, improving the core and hacking stuff. Oh, and then I guess one last thing that I wanted to touch on before moving on to the other parts is the uh, improvements for the plugin developers. So, and, uh, in a way, the delivering features to the users is important for the core, but what's actually even more important is to enable plugins to do interesting things because uh, much of the value in Jenkins is actually derived from plugins, not from the core. So, for example, we finally uh, cut off the JDK 5 compatibility in the development environment in favor of supporting JDK 7. The Oracle removed certain API from JDK 7 that made our life difficult. Um, we've done all the follow-up work to integrate the Google Juice into the other dependency injection mechanism in the core, so the plugins can wire up themselves with other plugins by using this mechanism. Steven has wrote the uh, JUnit 4 test harness, which makes it a little bit easier to write tests. Uh, we have also the, improved the way the Groovy is used as a view template instead of a jelly. So, you know, you can have a step-by-step -step debugger tracing of the views so that you can get the ID auto-completion on the expression that you might be writing and so on. And we've been steadily adding extension points. Some of them I touched earlier. And then last time I checked it, but there's exactly 111 extension points total. But so that's the biggest number we had ever. We also supported Gradle as a way of creating plugins. I know some plugins have started taking advantage of it. And also the JRebel integration. So if you're, if you're interactively editing the code, uh, you can see your updates without restarting the whole Jenkins VM, which takes some time. So you know, in a way, so part of the features, especially this UI feature that I demoed, was driven by the result of the last year's survey. So this year, um, we are doing the survey again. You know, Tyler touched the details. The URL I show here is different, but they go to the same place. Um, so, you know, if you can tell us what you, uh, what you, what you think, that would be really useful for us to guide what we, where, the, where we need to spend on. And, uh, you know, the given, number, given the number of people in this room and then the, the number of the prizes that's offered by the general sponsors, this is a real steal, I think. I really regret I didn't take my wife here today so that she could put her name on. So, so please think about uh, filling it in, and then you stick around at the end of the day where we do the raffle survey. Oh, and yes, one more thing that is, um, so the, there is this proposal on the table in the developer community to bump up the Java requirements for you, for you users from Java 5 to start requiring Java 6. 
for running both Jenkins masters and slaves, and also for doing Maven project type builds. Um, so according to our statistics, currently only 1.5% of the user base runs Jenkins on Java 5. Um, and then in any case, the Java 5 was declared end of life at the three years ago. Right? So no one should be, no one is supposed to be running it anymore, but uh, I guess we can never really be sure. There are so many esoteric uh, platforms that we have to worry about. So this proposal has a very widespread, almost unanimous consensus among developers. So it will probably happen soon, unless we hear some screams from some users saying that, no, you can't do this for the sake of humanity. So if for some reason you cannot, you cannot upgrade to Java 6, you, this is the time for you to tell, right? Or forever fold your piece, I guess, as they say. So um, I, I wanted to sort of switch your hat a little bit and then uh, briefly talk about what I've been doing in some of my day job time. Um, so there is this one service that we've been building that's, um, well, I've spent a lot of my time on that's actually really nice that I wanted to show, which is called the Build Hive. So this is uh, this service for, actually, I need to use a different browser. Um, so uh, this is actually a service that lets you set up a build for your GitHub repositories very easily. So you can log in. You first log in through GitHub by using your credential. And then, uh, so this is like fake Kosuke. This is Kosuke saying in Japanese. Um, and then you can create a new project, and then it will list up your GitHub repositories. So what I'm going to do is if you click this enable button, it will build Hive, it will sniff what's in your repository, um, and then create the Jenkins job automatically. So in this case, it's uh, actually an Ant project. So if you'll see, um, it has figured out that it's an Ant job, and then, um, gee, you, you really almost can't see anything here. Can Hmm, that's, um, that's a bummer. So I guess, well, I guess you'd have to, does it help if I make the font bigger? Not really. Oh, I see, yeah, okay. Ah, ah thank you. Um, so yeah, so I guess it did, it did detect that it was an ant field and executing it as ant script. Now what makes this interesting is that um, it can also act as a Git uh, repository on its own. So let's say this is my repository that I just built. So if I check this out in the workspace. And um, let me make some change. And then I'm intentionally putting some things in there that breaks the build. Adding a new feature in the build script. Now, if I was if I was to just going to push this change up, then this will break the repositories. And then, I mean, I, I'll detect that if I was running the build server, but um, it's a bit too late. So, where what we added in the build hive that, in my mind, is really useful is you can actually send the changes directly to the build hive. So here's the instruction to do it. Um, that is um, well. So let me highlight that. I guess I can copy this button and uh, get the hyperlink. So this will add Jenkins as a remote repository. So whereas I would normally push this to the upstream, I'm going to change it instead and then push this to Jenkins. So what will happen is it will notice that I just sent in a new commit, and then it will build my changes. And then sure enough, it caused a failure. So you know, granted, granted, if I get a notification of this, then I can make um, I can fix this. And I could, uh, I could just, um, instead of, I could amend the commit if I wanted to. It doesn't really matter how you do it. And then now if I push the change, oh, and then let me also verify that this change actually did not hit the server yet. So whatever it's in the server right now is actually still in the clean slate. So the Jen because Jenkins, I mean, the build hive kind of blocked the service from, I mean, the, the broken commits from going up to the real repositories. And now I sent in a new set of commits. So if I go back to the project, uh, you'll see that the, well, I guess it's too fast. It, already, it has already finished building it. But more importantly, because this time the build has passed, um, if I go reload the repository, you'll see that my change 
has landed on these repositories. And then if I see the build XML, it's having the correct um, XML. So at no point in time, this will not, this, by doing it this way, the build have will not allow me to push the broken changes. So this is actually very useful for people like me who, you know, if it doesn't actually do the due diligence of testing stuff locally and then break the repository left and right. So um, that's just quickly what I wanted to show you. It's a free service, and then and so I'd love to get some, um, some of you guys to try it out and then hear your thoughts on it. Um, and the other thing I spent some time on is this Jenkins Enterprise by CloudBeast. I think we'll be doing a talk later today, so I'll, the, um, I'll only touch this briefly. But in the last, last release, we added this highly HA support, or this uh, validated more JKA unbreakable builds to follow the Oracle tradition of using unbreakable, um, which is basically what I just showed you in the build high, but package for your own Jenkins installations. And then we also opened up some of the older plugins that we developed in earlier version of Jenkins Enterprise and then opening it, uh, opening it up for free. So if you install this CloudBees free enterprise plugin, you get folder plugin and backup to cloud for free. Okay, so that was some of what's keeping me busy in my day job and earned the bread for me. But then now back to the open source uh, Jenkins project. And uh, so, so far I told you about all kinds of the features and code that we've been doing in a project. But to, for the project to, you know, to live, it, we need to do actually a lot more than just coding. So that's what I wanted to talk about in this part. Um, so the Tyler, Tyler mentioned, uh, last year we went to work in five places around the world, and I was fortunate enough to be able to go to all of those. But in addition to those, we meet more meetups. So we were present in the FOSTEM, which is a big European open source meetups. We also was present in Scale 10x, which is in LA. We, there is a user event in Copenhagen, which attracted, I think, close to 100 people. Um, we, had a meet, we were present in the meetups in Austin, Munchen, various places in Japan. Um, so you know, we've been doing a lot of outreach activities, and I think it's pretty important. So this year, I think we are doing, at least the project is committed to send some people to foster them. Looks like there is a great level of enthusiasm in going there. And then we'll, we'll be doing next day, you see, again in San Francisco next year, maybe around the same time. But otherwise, I think we also want to shift toward the, uh, the smaller and hopefully more cheaper events. Um, that, and then one thing we learned is that when, we, when you work with local people, it really works better, because those people are well connected and speak the right language and whatnot. So the Lisa made uh, this nice post up there explaining how you can start your own meetup. So, you know, if, you're, if some of you are here from the other parts of the world, I'd highly encourage you to, um, to follow that and try that. And especially for those of us who came from Asia, by which I mean like Korea, China, and India. Hello, where are we? And so you really need to get that going. You see these push pins are missing in your country? That's not good. We need to fix that. Um, so to help with this outreach program, we are doing this Jenkins CIA program. It's a Jenkins CIA ambassador program. And uh, so if you, if you are thinking about speaking about Jenkins in some conferences, the people who don't know about it, so this is your opportunity. And you just have to tell us, and we will send you the T-shirts, this awesome T-shirt that has this logo on it, and then for you to wear, and all the stickers so that you can hand it out to your attendees. And then we are building this world map with push pins that, so that we know which cities have been conquered. So we need more push pins down, and then so this is a free gift for you, and then you just have to do a few more things like blog post. So join the CIA and become an agent and help us spread the word. Um, now, the other thing we are doing in the uh, community is the, um, the formalizing a bit of the security advisory handling. So the, the, just as a recap, when the vulnerability is detected by a user or by us, we prepare a fix and then make a release and issue a security advisory. And uh, so you can, I, I highly encourage you to subscribe it through email or the RSS feeds. Um, and this is especially relevant for those of you who run Jenkins on the public network because that's the highest risk. But you still aren't completely immune just because you run your Jenkins inside the corporate firewall. Um, there is still some attack vectors there. So we've been formalizing this process a bit lately. So we created this, uh, this sort mailing list so that people can send a notification or we can discuss these fixes to the vulnerability behind the closed door. It used to be that I was the only one getting a notification, but that's not uh, good in terms of the uh, bus factor. So we are fixing those. And we are starting to see some people sign up for this effort. 
Another thing we made recently is to deploy the cache layer for the, our confluence, the wiki.jenkinsci.org. Despite all our attempts, we never could have managed to run Confluence fast enough. And I think a lot of kudos for Atlas and people who somehow figured that out. But so in the end, what we did was I wrote this plugin in the Confluence that generates the static version of the page at the right moment. And then there's a front end sitting uh, up front. And then if it finds a cache, it will serve from the cache. And otherwise, all the other requests goes to the Confluence. So hopefully, um, this has been deployed in the past few weeks. Um, and hopefully you find um, you find your wiki performance a lot better, especially in dynamically generated pages like the plugin index page, which used to take like seven or ten seconds to load, but now it's a snap. Um, now the dummy now the other effort is the dummy's pet project, which is a usage statistics analysis. So um, I think for the past uh, half year or so, we've been show we started showing the installation count and the growth for every plugin. And then, so this is in a hope of you figuring out which plugin is better managed and better used. There's a safety number, so naturally you want to use the plugin that's widely used. And this data is also available in JSON form if someone wants to do more interesting analysis on those. And his, the other labor, other fruit of his labor is the stats.jenkinsci.org, which give you this SVG graphs and concrete numbers of where the installation counts are and how they are growing. So some of the earlier slides I showed today is actually based on the same numbers. Now, um, another effort that we only spent actually a limited number of efforts, limited amount of efforts, but had a good, uh, good progress is the black box end-to-end -end testing. So the motivation here is that the, you know, Jenkins had, a, for the longest time, it had this, um, the test harness that's based around JUnit and Jetty. So that was good, um, except um, except that uh, it's kind of testing things in a bit weird environment. So what we wanted to do was to actually test the, the Jenkins in exactly the same way as you'd use it. So maybe on the Tomcat or maybe in a, in a Debian package or something. And then so that's, the, that's what we, that's what we uh, had in mind when we started this project. And then, you know, so we came up with so far the Ruby-based test harness that has Capybara and the cucumber built on top of it. So it's kind of like acceptance level testing, not the, uh, not the um, small level test. Um, and we also abstracted away the, the way we start Jenkins and stop Jenkins. So combined with something like Bouye Grant, we can, um, Vagrant, we can sort of really simulate the exact same way that you'd be using it. So hopefully this will all start becoming a part of the regular executions um, and then help you improve the quality. For developers, we did a number of things. Um, we created this mother of all repositories, which contains all 800 GitHub repositories we have into a single thing so that you can very easily grip through the entire plugin source code. So let's say if you look at some of the extension point that wanted to figure out how other people are using it, this would be a very easy way to do so. Um, and also, I guess, this, high, this 800 repositories in a single organization is definitely pushing GitHub UI to its limit. So we started running this automated daemon that lists up all the plugins along with their Maven coordinates. So that if you look at, if you, if you, uh, if you have some dependency that you don't know where they came from, uh, you can look at this page and then figure out which repository needs to be obtained. We also have a separate um, the daemon running that actually parses all the source code of plugins. So internally, it does a pretty clever things. That, and then figure out all the extension points defined in core and in plugins. And not only that, it also lists in all the implementation that's known to the human universe and then give you in a single wiki page. So again, this is another convenient way for plugin developers to figure out what the extension point might be relevant to them. And then if they once identify those, they can look at the implementations that other people did to get the idea of you know, how to use it or simply cut and paste the code. Um, on the infrastructure side, uh, we've been doing the, we've deployed the NAGIOS to monitor the services and also integrate it with the pager duty. So um, occasionally the Tyler and I or a few other people get the, get the uh, our email, I'm sorry, the page when the server goes down. Uh, we expanded our mirrors to nines, uh, serving all these bits, because otherwise we'd be bankrupt a long time ago. Um, the DNS servers are managed by Puppet, and I guess our use of Puppet has generally speaking increased. 
uh, a lot. Um, you know, we didn't come all the way, but a lot. So we've been sort of formalizing the, the way we run servers more and more into the proper state. And offloading some of the services where we can. Okay, um, so um, the other effort that we are doing with the help of Max, who is here today, is the doing the office hours. So this is actually um, a once in two weeks, bi-weekly, one hour, one hour WebEx conference call. The original motivation was to use this uh, virtual meetup so that um, you know, we organize the agenda up front, maybe use it as a mini presentations or the Q&A on certain topics and show and tell for the plugin developers. But due to the lack of the cycles on my side of organizing these things up, um, so far in the, currently this is mostly more or less used as the Ask Kosuke hour. So the plugin developers would come or the core developers would come and we talk about various aspects of the code and that's how we use it. But if someone is interested in helping us organize this better, then we'd be very happy to bring it a bit close back to this uh, the you know, virtual meetup kind of usage. So uh, I guess this is another area that we are, we could really use a volunteer. So um, I now so that I wanted to switch a gear a little bit and talk about upcoming features. Now, the thing is, well, I guess the caveat first is that the, 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 as we said, because this is an open source project, right? The, even though the, all I can do is like tell other contributors that, look, this is what I think we should be doing, but that's what they actually do in the end is, is not normally something else. So this, what I'm saying here is not necessarily what's going to happen, but this is where I think we need to go, and then I'd love to get your thoughts on these things. Um, so when I think about the future directions in Jenkins, I think of sort of two directions that we need to go. The one is going up, and then the sort of dealing with more complex installations, stuff like that. The other is going down, meaning try to reach to the lower end and then make simple things even simpler. And I think we need to do both of those. So on the front of the more, making more complex things easier front, going up direction, which hopefully, which probably is more relevant to people here because I guess you're already using Jenkins. Um, so, you know, we, we need to make it easier for people to run uh, complex deployments. And when I say complex deployments, it involves, you know, part of it is about having a large cluster, part of it is having lots of jobs, and part of it is having, you know, jobs that needs to be choreographed to do certain things. Um, and then, so in this front, for example, we wanted to start, I wanted to start expanding into master-to-master -master communication. So if your organization had lots of masters, they should be able to talk to each other to do some interesting stuff. The daisy loading work, even though it's gonna get released soon, it's only the first step in this work that needs to happen to really fully take advantage of it. So there needs to be a lot more follow-up work done, needs to be done in the core, and also in the plugins to make it easier for you to keep like thousands of build records and thousands of jobs without you know, bringing down the whole thing. And uh, we also want, I really want to have the relational database trays for some certain limited use, like test reports or the code analysis results. And so I think it's high time to put those things and open it up for plugins for them to be able to use them. Um, another area is about sort of workflows slash pipeline slash choreography kind of thing that is about, you know, when you have a lot of jobs that needs to interact with each other, we need to make this easier. And fortunately, I think a lot of plugin developers are sharing the same concern, and we see a number of interesting plugins being developed in this space, some of which we'll have with our own sessions later today. Um, and then also, for, to cope with these kind of use cases, well, we need to be able to slice up the build histories. So you got a single, let's say, parameterized jobs, and they want to be able to see a subset of the builds as if they are its own job. Right? This has been given a little feedback to me from a number of serious users, and I started to see the point behind it. And then as the other thing is when those different jobs interact together to create like a single workflow, there needs to be certain shared context, you know, be it the place to store files or things like that. Um, or remember who started it, or the, you know, the version control system division that was supposed to be used, and so on. I, and these things also need to be in the part of the core for plugins to be able to use them. Now, another front I think is actually important when dealing with this workflow stuff is being for Jenkins to be able to model external systems. And when I say external systems, those are things like the database or the QA test environments that the Jenkins would interact with. 
So let's say if you have a three test QA environments that you can use at any given time, it'd be really nice if Jenkins would know about these three things and being able to figure out who is using what, which one of those environments right now, what was the last action performed to it, and things like that. Um, so by doing that, I think it could sort of provide more useful information that connects various systems. And this connecting all the kinds of different systems is something Jenkins is really good at because it's got, you know, it's quite extensible. So these are the kind of sort of the grand work that I think needs to happen in the core to make plugins do more workflow choreography stuff better. Now, the, another entirely different direction is to make simple things even simpler. Um, so uh, one of the lessons, well, I guess one of the lessons I learned in BuildHive or the motivation that went into BuildHive is that, you know, sometimes the creating a new job is actually fairly time consuming once you, once you realize that. So we wanted to make it easier. Um, and then, so to make that easier, for example, we want to do more spying on your build process instead of asking you where things are. So for example, right now in the freestyle project, Jenkins needs to ask you where you are producing test reports to. But if you, let's say, using Ant, you know, Ant already knows where it is putting the output. So if those two build tools can talk behind the scene, then we don't have to bother you to figure that out. You can already see this in action in the Maven project where you pretty much everything autom happens automatically. But I think we want to start doing more of this in other build tools. And I, I guess I was just actually hacking yesterday and then I put some version of this for Ant together. So um, this is coming soon, um, up to at least to some build tools. And then the other thing is we want, wanted to bring back this repository sniffing capability from the build hive and then back into the open source project. So you know, if you can just look at the repository and then see, oh, this looks like an Ant project because you have a build XML, or this looks like a Maven project because you have such, such and such files, then we can sort of give you this 70% accurate initial project configurations and combined with the spying, you know, we can, we can sort of get a good portion of things pre-configured for you just by you clicking a single button, which I think is very nice. Um, and also in the same front, um, another thing that I think needs to be easier is sharing recipes for the lack of better words. Um, when I say recipes, so you know, one of the key theme in, in Jenkins user conferences like this is you know, users want to talk about how they put together various interesting features to do some interesting things so that the other users could replicate what they are doing. But, um, so far, this replicating basically relies on people using English and then someone else trying to type up what that means and then translate that into configurations. So if you can figure out the better ways for people to share some configurations or certain ways of doing things in more easier ways so that you could actually deploy with a few button clicks, I think that would make a long way toward making everyone's life easier without reinventing the wheel. So that's the kind of thing I think we need to do. In, in sort of making things, simple things easier. And then the plugins, I think the update center related things is another challenge. I think 600 plugins is both a blessing and a curse. Um, so for example, we clearly need to revisit the free bundled plugins. I mean, why is CVS plugin still default plugin and then not Git plugin, right? Hello, this is 21st century. Um, so we need to fix those things. I mean, there's a, some good technical reason behind that, but the user did not care, right? So we have to fix those things. Um, the other one is, I think, the notion of clustering plugins, aka plugins packs. So there is a great website called jenkins-php.org, which sort of talks about all kinds of plugins that's relevant for the PHP developers. They also have a job template for the PHP guys to use. And so these things sort of jumpstart the PHP developers into Jenkins, and then that had a tremendous success in bringing PHP people onto Jenkins. So now I wanted to do something similar for all kinds of other things like you know, iOS development, Android, whatnot. Because sometimes it's not obvious what plugins you want to use. So this will help people get started with you know, the more out-of-box experience, right? which is actually pretty important. Um, and then on plugins, uh, maybe we started needing to provide like a reviews and feedback so that you can easily see which plugins are, you know, are better than the others and which is taking over something else and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of things that needs to be done there. Um, and um, like I said before, these making the life easier for plugin developers is actually of paramount importance. So we clearly need to add more extension points. For example, the one of the prime 
extension point that needs to be added is to, to sort of flag, to make the garbage collection and the build records more plugable. Um, that has been long overdue. Um, and we also generally need to make the plugin development experience more, um, well, better or, the, or more smoother. And it, I'm not exactly sure what needs to be done because I guess I'm so into this that I lost a fresh people's perspective. But so maybe it's like a more documentation, perhaps more documentation needs to be written. I mean, clearly more samples are good too. And then it, maybe it's high time for someone to develop or like even a commercial training course, right? I mean, I, I thought that'd be great because in that way, that the guy could be equipped the cost and still deliver the, uh, the good training, plugin development material for the rest of the world. And we also want to improve the development mode support. So one lesson that I learned with uh, the Jenkins Ruby plugin development effort is that the Ruby guys came up with a number of good techniques for helping developers. So it's like a skeleton generation of the PCs not the initial, not, not the initial, you know, code generation resort, but the one that you can use to add implementation for whatever extension point you care about, or proactively checking the common pitfalls that you might encounter. So, you know, the the, the worst one I think is like a jelly tag. They, they they have to have certain relationships, or like it will fail, and it's very it's very brittle. So we, if in the development mode we can proactively look out for these things and give you an easy feedback. That's actually very good. So, you know, I, as I said, I kind of, it's difficult for me to put myself in the shoes of the fresh developers. So this is something that you need to, you guys need to tell us that where you, you know, what's needed to make this better. Because we, we clearly need, you know, I agree that we need to make something better. So just tell us what that something is. Okay, so um, I think I'm already running out of time, technically. So uh, just to wrap up, um, so a, a lot, as, as hopefully I was able to show you, a lot has been done in the project, both in the user visible features, but in more like you know, how we run the project and then various other peripheral efforts. Um, and then there is a lot more, lot more work in that little space to come. So you can expect another um, frenzy year from Jenkins project. Well, next year, we're going to hit the uh, 1.500, which is a quite, uh, I think we should be on the Guinness World Record book or something for the number of release, no? Um, and uh, the, there's, a number, there's a great number of efforts in the project that needs more people to carry the flag. Um, so, you know, these testing efforts, this, uh, the simplifying the plugin development efforts, there's a lot, all these things that needs to be done but doesn't have enough volunteers to help us. So, you know, I'd also like to extend the reach so that, uh, and encourage you to sort of join the project. There's, Lots of things for many people to do. Um, even if the coding might not be a forte, you could still help us help us the project in a tremendous way. So I wanted to yeah, encourage you to do that. Um, it's the, in the spirit of open source. And otherwise, um, I think this is uh, the kind of a rare, unusual opportunity because most of the time, these people who are interested in like the builds and the automation stuff are normally a minority inside a company. So you don't really get to share this enthusiasm for putting other people out of work uh, with other folks. But here we have this room full of those people whose passion is about that. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and then try to talk to each other and then share the war stories and uh, pat on the back and so on and so forth. So uh, with that, I think my part is over. So thank you very much. And then please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.